Here's the Prime Minister. Let's listen in live from Ottawa this morning. Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the National Press Theatre. My name is Philippe. I am going to take questions. Mr. Trudeau will make a statement and then we'll be taking questions. Raise your hand. I'll make a list. You know how that works after the statement of Mr. Trudeau. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at this early morning press conference. As you know, I have to be in Iqaluit in a few hours. I know you've all been wanting to hear from me directly on the SNC-Lavalin issue. I've taken time to review the testimony, to reflect on what has happened over the past months and on what our next steps should be. Je tiens à faire le point. I would like to give you an update based on what I've heard in the testimony. As you know, I met with Josie Wilson-Raybould and the clerk of the Privy Council on September 17th. During these meetings, I raised the SNC-Lavalin file. And as you heard, I reaffirmed that the decision was up to the AG to make. Yes, I did mention that I was a member, the member for Papineau, and I have the great honor to represent Papineau, and I've done this for more than 10 years. I care about the families, workers, and students in my writing, but this comment wasn't partisan in nature. As parliamentarians, to defend the interests of the communities we were elected to represent, to be the voice of those communities in Ottawa. I stressed the importance of protecting Canadian jobs and reiterated that this issue was one of significant national importance. Ms. Wilson-Raybould left that meeting, saying that she would speak with her deputy minister and the clerk about this matter, but that the decision was hers alone. In the months that followed that meeting, I asked my staff to follow up regarding Ms. Wilson-Raybould's final decision. I realize now that, in addition, I should have done so personally, given the importance of this issue and the jobs that were on the line. In recent days, I have reviewed the testimony from the Justice Committee, including that given by Ms. Wilson-Raybould, Gerald Butts, the Clerk of the Privy Council, and the Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General, recalling various interactions. Each of these interactions was a conversation among colleagues about how to tackle a challenging issue. Each came at a time when my staff and I believed that the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General was open to considering other aspects of the public interest. However, I now understand that she saw it differently. What has become clear through the various testimonies is that over the past months, there was an erosion of trust between my office and specifically my former principal secretary and the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General. I was not aware of that erosion of trust. As Prime Minister and leader of the federal ministry, I should have been. After several witnesses appeared, it has become clear that over the past few months, that confidence has eroded between my office and uh, that, well, my former principal secretary and the former AG. I was not aware of this erosion of trust. And as Prime Minister and head of the cabinet, I should have been aware of it. They've been sharing their advice, perspectives and experience with me over these past weeks. What is clear is that there are many different styles of and approaches to leadership. There's one theory that the most effective leaders are adversarial and almost tough to a fault. That's not what I believe. I believe that real leadership is about listening, learning, and compassion. It's about the push and pull of robust discourse and honest debate. It's about transparency and accountability. One of the things central to my leadership is fostering an environment where my ministers, caucus, and staff feel comfortable coming to me when they have concerns. Indeed, I expect them to do so. In Ms. Wilson-Raybould's case, she did not come to me, and I wish she had. Because if it's a real relationship, and if we truly are a team, 
we can always acknowledge when we need to make adjustments. Things won't always be perfect, but there should remain a constant level of openness and dialogue. And that dialogue is crucial on a file as important as justice. I'm not going to surprise anyone when I say that my father and me had different leadership styles. But I can also tell you that the files that were closest to his heart, they are also for me. And it's the justice file. I was immensely pleased to discover that the new Prime Minister's office in the West Bloc was an office that was occupied by my father when he was Minister of Justice. And throughout his career, he was dedicated to that principle of justice, the just society, the charter of rights and freedoms. And his approach of justice and fairness infused everything he did, and certainly was something that he raised me with. So as I look at the different departments and responsibilities and things that a government must do, the justice file has always been one that has been of particular importance and interest to me. It is something that I, has always been of particular interest to me, and I've always, it's always been very close to my heart. And the work we have done over the past few years on justice has always been very important to me. The reconcili reconciliation files, the medical assisted dying file, the cannabis and pardon files. These principles of justice are fundamental for me in terms of who we are as a country and who we want to be as a society. I've spent my entire political career fighting for justice and for people. Social justice, protecting Canadian jobs. Well, since I started politics, I've always worked to the best of my abilities to represent people faithfully. The SNC-Lavalin file was no exception to this rule. Is a company that employs 9,000 Canadians across this company, country. They create many thousand spin-off jobs in peripheral industries. They, directly or indirectly, put food on the table for countless families as one of Canada's major employers. But they are also a company facing serious criminal charges. The context is a tough one, with potential job losses in the thousands. These are the types of situations that make governing a challenge. And when there's an erosion of trust within the people involved, it further complicates what is already a difficult decision for the Attorney General. This has been a tough few weeks. Canadians expect and deserve to have faith in their institutions and the people who act within them. Almost every day as Prime Minister, I learn new things. So I can tell you without a doubt that I have taken and will continue to take many lessons from these recent days and weeks. We're going to ask advice from external experts on various files that are related to the issues raised in recent weeks, notably the dual role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General, and policies and operational practices of the Cabinet, the Public Service, and how we deal with legal issues and general issues. We will be seeking external expert opinions on a number of things as they relate to the set of issues raised over the past few weeks. This includes the dual role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General, as well as the operating policies and practices across Cabinet, the Public Service and political staff as they relate specifically to judicial matters, but also more general. Ultimately, I believe our government will be stronger for having wrestled with these issues. This morning, I am headed north to Iqaluit to deliver an official apology for the federal government's management of tuberculosis in the north 
in the 1940s to 1960s and the harms this created in Inuit communities. This is an important day, and this apology will be another defining moment along the road to reconciliation. Our government has said from the very beginning that there is no relationship more important to us than the one we share with Indigenous peoples. That remains true, and we will work hard to advance reconciliation each and every day. On Friday, I'll be in Toronto, marking International Women's Day with incredible young leaders. I plan to listen and learn from their lived experiences as we talk about how we can work together to deliver true gender equality in this country and around the world. Et la semaine prochaine. And next week, and all the other weeks that will follow, my government and the Liberal team will focus on the mission that Canadian electors gave us, building a strong economy, attracting better jobs, and creating better opportunities for middle-class Canadians. After all, we're here for that. Thank you for being with us this morning. I'll now be happy to answer your questions. One follow-up, let's keep them short. We have a lot of questions, not a lot of time. Uh, we'll start with the Globe and Mail. Gloria. <coughs> No one from the Globe and Mail? <laughs> right. no. Prime Minister, what about the uh, activities of your staff and all of this? The clerk, all of these suggestions that in those meetings with Jody Wilson-Raybould, there was issues of we have to get elected, we can't just make this a, a, a justice decision. Uh, you're running into a collision with the Prime Minister. What about all that? Uh, every conversation that was had was obviously focused on the well-being of Canadians. Uh, it is our responsibility to ensure that we're doing everything we can to protect jobs, to grow our economy, to ensure that pensioners and workers are protected. And that's something that my, jo my job and my team uh, take very, very seriously. Uh, every step of the way, however, we are careful to ensure that we are respecting our institutions and, indeed, the integrity of the justice system. But did those things happen? Did your aides say, it's all right to have a good justice policy, but we have to get elected? Did your aides talk about Quebec politics uh, and your re-election in the context of a criminal prosecution? Uh, there were uh, detailed conversations on a broad range of things that were discussed and, and laid bare in the various testimonies that we, uh, that we heard over the past weeks. What I can tell you is my team uh, and everyone in this government always remains focused on uh, how we make sure that we're protecting jobs and building a better future for Canadians and doing so in a way that protects our institutions. Radio-Canada. Good morning. You lost two ministers. They've said they have no confidence, to, no longer have confidence sitting around the cabinet table. How can you keep them within your caucus and maintain cohesion among the team? Ms. Wilson-Raybolt and Dr. Philpott both indicated that they wanted to, to remain in the Liberal caucus as members and they fundamentally believe in our agenda growth for the middle class, protecting the environment, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And that is exactly what we're going to work on as a team. As regards to their reflections, you'll need to ask the, them the question. Are you concerned about the fact that this matter has caused divisions, raised tension between Quebec and the rest of Canada? We acknowledge that there are good jobs created by SNC-Lavelin across the country from Newfoundland to Alberta, including Ontario and Quebec. As Canadians, there is an expectation that we will protect jobs, focus on economic growth in all sectors. And I don't believe that this uh, calls into question the various parts of the country. Turn down your offer to become Indigenous Services Minister. Why did you feel compelled to move her to a different portfolio? Why didn't you just leave her in the justice portfolio if you felt she was doing a good job there? Um, 
I think it's uh, extremely important uh, to ensure that you have strong people uh, leading different parts of the government. And there is no question that reconciliation and indeed the relationship with Indigenous peoples uh, was something uh, that has always been uh, at the heart of the priorities of this government. So looking to have uh, a strong leader who, whose engagement in uh, Indigenous uh, issues has been lifelong and whose thoughtful approach on this was something that I relied on quite significantly, particularly as we were moving forward on historic legislations like Child and Family Services, which is actually about empowering Indigenous communities and, and Indigenous uh, leadership to control what happens to their children instead of having uh, the federal government or provincial governments do that. These were important things that I thought uh, she was uh, going to be, uh, she would be uh, excellent at, and that it would be very good to indicate just how much this issue continued to matter to our government, even though we had moved uh, Minister Philpott out of that file. You, you didn't really address the point of my question. Uh, she had a, a fairly plausible explanation of why she couldn't, in good faith, take that job <laughs> on, because she didn't want to have to enforce the Indian Act that she'd spoken out against previously. Why not leave her as Justice Minister? And do you regret not leaving her as Justice Minister? I think uh, as we look back over the past past weeks, there are many, of less, many lessons to be learned. Uh, and many things that uh, uh, we would like to ha have done differently. And that is certainly part of the reflection uh, we need to have going forward. Uh, but uh, in terms of how we move forward and how we uh, make decisions in who is going to be in the uh, in and where uh, within Cabinet, uh, those decisions uh, are ones that we take seriously, and we always look to move forward, not backwards on that. Le Devoir. Hulaine Buzetti, Le Devoir. Listening to the Minister of Justice, the minister took seven days to make the decision. She was in Fiji on vacation at that time. In your opinion, did she do due diligence required in that case? What is your interpretation of her open-mindedness regarding this issue? Well, as I've said, since the fall, we felt that the minister was open to listening to other opinions and to continue to reflect on these decisions because it was included in the act that the decision could be made at any point in time. So it's in that regard that we continued, my office continued to have the conversations at different times with her. What we see now is that she wasn't uh, prepared to, to change her mind. And these are questions that you need to put to, hear I, to her. Now, do you consider then that this uh, position was justified? Well, what I expect of all of my ministers and of myself and in fact, something that uh, Ms. Wilson Rebold has always shown since I've known her is uh, that we listen to different opinions and make a decision. I think that that's the way that it uh, should be done. And I considered to that she was open during that period. Well, we've learned now that she was not open to that. The Minister Wilson Rabel says that she told you on September 17th that she had made her decision, and after that, you told your staff to continue to work on the file. Why would why would you ask them to continue to work on it if she told you she'd already made up her mind? Uh, part of the uh, terms of the DPA uh, indicates that that decision can be taken uh, by the Attorney General up until uh, the very last minute of a trial. So we considered that uh, she was still open to uh, hearing uh, different arguments and different approaches on uh, what her decision could be. As we now learned through this testimony, that was not the case. Uh, but like I said, there was a um, an erosion of trust, a, a lack of communications uh, to me, 
um, and to my office about her uh, her state of mind on this, and that is certainly something that uh, I'm having to reflect on as a leader and that I'm looking forward to improving on as we go forward. I've always tried to foster uh, an environment in which uh, people can come and share with me their concerns, large or small, whether they be cabinet ministers or caucus members, uh, but uh, there's always room for improvement, obviously. You said you're seeking outside legal, uh, legal opinions on a number of matters, including how your staff and civil servants relate to justice. Can you explain that a little bit more? What are you hoping to learn, and, and when will this happen? Uh, we've reached out to a number of, of uh, uh, thoughtful uh, Canadian leaders, and uh, we will have more to announce uh, as we move forward. But there's no question that there uh, are lessons to be learned from uh, this situation, and, and Canadians expect us to, uh, as we go through uh, difficult situations that we um, draw lessons from them and make sure that we do even better next time. Canadians are seeing two versions. Why should they believe your version, Mr. Butts's version, as opposed to Ms. Wilson-Raybould's version? I acknowledge that within my office, and with respect to the testimony by Ms. Wilson-Raybould. There are different perspectives. As Prime Minister, I can reassure Canadians that the integrity of our institutions was never affected. Our justice system and the independence of it was always maintained. Situations were experienced differently and I regret that. I plan to ensure that we have measures in place to improve the way my office works when it comes to contact with ministers and caucus members, but to Canadians can rest assured that the rule of law remains fully intact. The Globe and Mail came out with an article on the 7th of February. Do you have a comment on that? There were comments on a delicate issue. There was never any pressure provided. Uh, Jerry Butts testified yesterday that when Jody Wilson-Raybould refused the offer to move to Indigenous service, he advised you that you needed to move her anyway because if you let a minister veto her appointment, you would lose control of your cabinet. Is that why you didn't leave her in the justice portfolio or move her to Veterans Affairs? No. Any decision to move uh, a minister uh, or, or make changes to cabinet uh, has uh, multiple multiple uh, reasons and reflections and motivations. Uh, and there were already many decisions that had been made and were uh, in the process of being made uh, that uh, there wasn't any question of moving backwards on. Uh, we were going to keep moving forwards. Uh, there are obviously many different factors that, uh, that go into any decision like this. And um, the, the offer uh, on Indigenous services uh, was a, a serious positive one. Uh, and the offer on Veterans Affairs, uh, which was accepted, uh, was also one that I thought was the right one for our cabinet and our country. Prime Minister, you, you said off the top that transparency is an important part of leadership. So in that vein, can you confirm for us what your staff said to Jody Wilson-Raybould exactly and whether they raised the political concerns such as needing to get re-elected in their conversations with her? Because that's an important part of the story. I think Canadians would like an answer on from your office. I'm sure there were a broad range of issues discussed in these conversations. Uh, we heard detailed, tem uh, de detailed testimony uh, on that uh, over the past couple of days. And certainly the Ethics Commission will be looking into these matters to ensure uh, that the highest ethical standards were uh, kept and maintained and, and addressed, that this is something that uh, continues to be a process. But as I said, the matter of uh, the loss of thousands of jobs, the, uh, the concern uh, around pensioners, the concerns around the Canadian economy are very real things that every government uh, needs to preoccupy itself with. Uh, separate from, in addition to, any uh, electoral concerns. Uh, this is something that, that Canadians expect, uh, that we be fighting for jobs in the right way, and that's exactly what we've always done. La presse. Oui, Monsieur Trudeau. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. 
On the 17th of September, Ms. Wilson-Raybould said that she – was she clear with respect to her remarks on the 17th of September? She indicated that it was her intention to not proceed with it, but that she was going to revisit the question and reflect further on the matter because I had asked her to do so. But at the meeting on, the September, on September 17th, we talked much more about reconciliation and recognition of Indigenous rights than we did the issue of SNC-Lavelin as part of a 30 to 45 minute meeting. We spent perhaps five minutes on SNC and uh, the rest of the time on reconciliation. Listening to Mr. Butts yesterday and again this morning, the SNC-Lavelin cost uh, two ministers Mr. Butts's position in summary. It's a misunderstanding between your office and Ms. wilson Bolt. That's what it boils down to. There is a difference of perspective. We feel that Ms. wilson Raybould was ready to consider other options, and we have learned since that she was not open to that. She considered that each time we mentioned it, it was inappropriate. For me and my team to continue talking about such an important issue, well, that's part of our job. There are many issues where we had a number of meetings, NAFTA and thousands of jobs there, investments in various industries and innovation. We're always concerned by jobs, whether it be a factory with 300 people that plans to close. That's part of our responsibility to always ensure that we're doing our utmost legitimately to protect those jobs. And that is what we did. Um, Prime Minister, can we go back to September 17th? What exactly and precisely did you say to Jody wilson Raybould? And what exactly did you not understand when she said, back off? Um, I said to her, uh, that I was preoccupied by uh, the number of jobs involved in, in this, uh, in Quebec and obviously across the country. This is something that I was uh, clear on, and then I asked her, even though I heard that she had uh, made a decision, she indicated to me that she, uh, she had made a decision, I asked her if she could revisit that decision, if she was uh, open to uh, considering, to looking at it once again, uh, and she said that she would. Um, as we look back and as we hear her testimony, as I understand, she went back and revisited it uh, over the following days and reconfirmed her decision for herself, um, and then felt that it was inappropriate uh, when we continued to talk about it and have conversations about it over the course of the fall. I wish she had come forward to me uh, in the fall uh, subsequent to that meeting to highlight that. She did not, and that, quite frankly, is something that I am reflecting on as a leader to make sure that everyone within my office and my cabinet and my caucus know that they can come forward to me with preoccupations like this. What exactly did Jody wilson Maybold say to you when she resigned on February 11th to you in that phone call in Vancouver? Uh, it, we met in person in Vancouver, uh, and uh, she simply uh, indicated to me that she felt she could no longer continue to serve uh, in, uh, in uh, my government. Uh, as I said uh, in my public statement following, I was both surprised and disappointed uh, by that decision, but obviously I, I accepted it. And uh, as we've heard uh, the testimony over the past uh, last week and, and as we've learned more about the situation, it's obvious that there was an erosion of trust uh, between uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould and uh, my office, particularly between her and Jerry, uh, that I was not aware of, uh, and I wish I had known about it earlier. So we'll have time maybe for two or three. Let's see if we can speed this up. Global. Hi, Amanda Connolly with Global. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you for taking our questions today. Just to clarify, are you apologizing for anything today? 
Um, I will be making an Inuit apology this afternoon. But in regards to, uh, and in regards to standing. In regards to standing up for jobs and defending the integrity of our, our rule of law, um, I continue to say that there was no inappropriate pressure. I'm obviously reflecting on lessons learned through this, and I think Canadians expect that of us, that uh, any time we go through periods of internal disagreement and, indeed, uh, challenges to internal trust as we have, there are things that we have to reflect on and understand and do better next time. Abigail Beeman taking the follow-up question. Uh, both Mr. Warnick and Mr. Butts testified that they had no direct empirical evidence of this $9,000 potential job loss, that number that kept, get floating, kept being floated around. Did you have any evidence of 9,000 jobs potentially being lost? Um, we uh, had uh, heard representations from uh, various sources, including the company itself. Uh, that this was uh, an issue of deep concern to them and that it would uh, potentially have consequences as dire as uh, the company having to uh, leave Canada altogether. And that would be something that obviously would have a severe impact on the thousands of people employed right across the country uh, by uh, this uh, engineering firm. So this was uh, an issue that we understood was serious. But uh, as I said, and as I continue to say, the decision uh, around a DPA uh, is not mine to make. La presse canadienne. Ms. Wilson Roy Bolt made her decision expeditiously. She said she no longer wanted to talk about it. She didn't pass on a legal opinion. How would you qualify her management of the file? Is this an acceptable way to take charge of such an important issue? Well, as I said, I will be asking experts to look at our processes with respect to how my office works, the action we take. This is something that we can learn from. And I know the Canadians expect us to do, say, do that. But my question dealt with her work and her approach. How do you assess the way she managed the file? This question is something that is uh, currently uh, before the court, the matter, so it would be uh, inappropriate for me to share my opinion on the matter. Mr. BBC. Can you tell Canadians why they should trust you over the former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould that this was about jobs and not politics? I think, I think people uh, understand that, Cana that a Canadian government always needs to stand up for workers, needs to stand up for jobs, needs to look to grow the economy, and that is something that, that all Canadians right across the country expect of their government. Uh, what uh, they are seeing in this uh, context is the result of uh, disagreements internally on the best ways to proceed. Uh, and it's something that within uh, the various perspectives that we heard in, in, uh, in testimony, uh, I can repeat and reassure Canadians that there was no breakdown of our systems, of our rule of law, of the integrity of our institutions. We, as a government, have continued to stay focused on big things that matter throughout this period, whether it's moving forward on historic child and family services legislation, uh, announcing uh, investments uh, in research development and uh, robotics and AI in regards to a space program. Uh, we've moved forward on uh, Stats Canada results that have uh, indicated that 825,000 Canadians have been lifted out of poverty. Throughout uh, this uh, internal disagreement, we have remained focused on the things that Canadians expect us to do, and that is what we are going to continue to do in regards to the choice that Canadians are going to be able to make this coming fall. I look forward to the opportunity to highlight what we are continuing to doing, what we continue to learn as we move forward in ways of better serving Canadians. But I'm very confident in our approach that has delivered 
tangibly and concretely for Canadians on economic growth, in regards to reconciliation, in regards to protection of the environment, on the things that matter deeply to Canadians. Do you acknowledge any failures in your promise to deliver an honest and transparent government? I think the discussions we're having this morning, what we've seen in the testimony, our participation in, in not just the Justice Committee process, but also uh, the Ethics Commissioner process, uh, is something that Canadians can look to to see that we do uh, take very seriously the need to continue uh, to give Canadians confidence uh, in their institutions and, indeed, in the rule of law. We're at a time where Canadians are worried about uh, the, what they see in the news from around the world, uh, the cynicism around our institutions, the polarization in our politics, and being able to demonstrate that we continue to defend our institutions despite um, internal challenges is something that I think Canadians can, uh, can deeply be reassured by. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Merci, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Merci, tout le monde. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, everyone. And with that, the Prime Minister has finished speaking at the National Press Theatre. So uh, let's uh, come back to Michel Boyer from CTV News. Okay, Michel, uh, a lot of people are wondering what they were going to hear. We know that it was definitely not an apology. Uh, there was nope. no breakdown in Canada's rule of law. There were no failings by the government here. There was perhaps an erosion of trust, and uh, the Prime Minister summoned the ghost of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Why, why did he speak today? What exactly did he say? Well, I think we also needed to hear the version of the Prime Minister. Ultimately, he is the one responsible. It's not just Jerry Butts, who some called the most powerful unelected man uh, this, uh, in the country. But we needed to hear from the PM himself because uh, this is affecting the Liberals. This is affecting the Liberal brand. And Justin Trudeau needed to set the record straight, at least uh, from his own mouth. But you're right. No, no apology. Uh, he did say, uh, he did concede, yes, there was that erosion of trust. Uh, retrospectively, he would have done things a little differently, particularly when it talks when he talks about the cabinet shuffle. Um, but he didn't necessarily get into any details as to why, when they were talking about the shuffle, which don't forget, which is why we're even talking about this in the first place, why when Jody Wilson Raybould uh, did not accept the Indigenous services, why not just really uh, place her back? He didn't get into any of the details, you know, about it, really. Uh, why he thought about removing her from there in the first place if she was doing an okay job. I, I do think uh, that uh, one, one thing that perhaps did stick was he referred to uh, every interaction uh, regarding SNC-Lavalin, uh, which had been described as undue pressure. Uh, uh, he wanted to mm -hmm. reframe his conversations among colleagues. Um, he, they, they, they saw things differently. He kept going back to this notion of erosion of trust. Uh, he, he spoke a bit about... Uh, leadership, his leadership style, uh, how it's uh, it's very open. He wanted essentially an open door policy, uh, expecting people to walk through that door to come talk to him if he had problems. And then it sort of sounded like he was shifting the blame back to her that she didn't come to him with with problems. So so I, again, I'm I'm still yeah. trying to figure out um, what 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 we heard that was new today and why he needed to speak if there was going to be no apology, if there was going to be no admission of perhaps procedural problems uh, within the PMO, uh, communication problems. Um, so I, I really don't, I, I'm, I'm struggling to, to figure out what we heard today. You know, let me, it's, this is what it sounds like to me. It sounds like Justin Trudeau has a perception of how his office works. There are many layers to the prime minister's office. There are hundreds of people that support all of those operations. I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, the PM's at the top. Uh, and then it sounds like he, he thinks that, you know, any minister can just waltz in, talk to him at any time. Uh, but there, were, uh, there are other layers that perhaps maybe Jody Wilson-Raybould felt that she could not go to the prime minister with uh, directly. Maybe she felt like because Justin Trudeau had said, if you're talking to Jerry Butts, it's like you're talking to me, that going to Jerry was enough. Uh, and then we heard yesterday's testimony. So I don't know necessarily why he chose not to apologize. Um, I think profound, like fundamentally, uh, Justin Trudeau and everybody in the PMO thinks that they were motivated. Their intent behind these conversations uh, was well-meaning, that they were caring about jobs. I believe them when they say that. Uh, but they, and they also felt like if Jody Wilson-Raybould really 
felt like her decision was final. She should have put that in writing, uh, and and that would have been the end of that. But that didn't happen. So yeah, you're right. Shifting the blame back to Jody Wilson-Raybould. He is saying that one of the lessons here is that he learned something new every day, uh, and part of learning mm -hmm. is uh, taking steps to improve, uh, including seeking external expert opinions and a review on, as we were talking about before, that dual role uh, that is uh, those two hats worn by the attorney general and the justice minister. Perhaps there right. needs to be something done to, to, to separate these, those two, keep one in cabinet and one out. Um, but I think a lot of Canadians are probably going to find it strange that on a day that we were expecting some sort of either apology or act of contrition, that there was no apology but an announcement of a concrete apology coming later today in Canada's north. Um, and almost a look of defiance in his eye when asked by a journalist, are you apologizing for anything today? And he said, well, I, there, is, uh, there is an Inuit apology coming later today. So um, if this was a PR uh, and a perception problem before, I don't know mm -hmm. that it's any less of one now. You know, I think that he really wants Canadians to look at the two stories and say, does this make sense? Do you understand why we were going to Jody Wilson-Raybould talking to her about this deferred prosecution agreement? By the way, it's not uh, SNC getting off scot-free. It would be like billions of dollars in fines and the ability to continue uh, operating uh, w with new people. Um, and I think he wants, he's just putting it out there and he wants Canadians to, to make the decision uh, on their own. You know, I didn't think we were going to get a message of contrition after I heard Jerry Butts' testimony because uh, he was poised, he was collected, he was measured, as was Jody Wilson-Raybould, uh, but he, lay out, he laid out their intent there uh, and they don't believe that they did anything wrong. They don't think there's anything wrong with going to the Attorney General and saying, you know, well, this is important to us because it affects a lot of Canadians. All right, CTV News is Michelle Boyer. Thanks again for spending your morning with us. We appreciate it.